Let's Talk About Kidneys takes a deep dive into the chronic kidney disease patient journey. We're here to inspire meaningful conversations and to help people living with CKD gain a full understanding of their disease. DNA began in 1971 with two providers and 10 employees. Today, we have over 25 locations in DFW, more than 100 providers, and over 300 dedicated employees. Join us as Dr. Ruben Velez reflects on our growth and what it means to provide 50 years of excellence in kidney care. Dr. Velez, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with us today because you have such a unique story as a part of the DNA journey. So you joined Dallas Nephrology Associates, from what I understand, in 1983. So you've been with them 38 years at this point. And this year, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary, which is huge. And DNA started, from what I understand, with two doctors and about 10 staff members. And now DNA has over 100 providers and 300 <coughs> staff members. I can't imagine the changes that you've seen over the years, but what's your perspective on how things have changed over the last 50 well, years? Well, I, I joined DNA when I was uh, 12 years old. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, it was a different time. It was a different era. It was different um, health care that time. But uh, Dr. Alan Hall and Dr. Ron Pratty, uh, it started uh, DNA uh, in 1971. Then they had several more people join DNA. I was number 13 when I joined DNA. Number so, 13. Lucky. So lucky 13. Yeah. Um, and at that time, it was considered one of the largest groups in the nation of kidney specialists. Uh, was it really? Uh, 13. Uh, uh, they, they started the first dialysis program in town. Um, Started uh, most of the uh, nephrology sections at different hospitals in town uh, that are now well known. But the beauty of this is 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 been a wild ride. Is is how it continued to grow for the need because um, it's sad, but there's uh, many patients with kidney disease in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, and many patients that need dialysis. Uh, dialysis was approved by Congress back in 1972. Okay. So so DNA started in 71, dialysis was started in 72, mm -hmm. and dialysis centers were opened up between 72 to 73, so the first dialysis center in the area. But like you well said, the growth has been amazing. Uh, DNA has been involved locally with every single hospital, leadership programs. Um, DNA has been in, involved with the uh, state, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, organizations with the state, with the network DNA started uh, uh, and was part of the uh, people that, that opened the uh, first organ transplant program. Uh, wow. And especially the organ bank uh, was one of the DNA leaders. And uh, and on top of that, uh, the network, which involves the whole state in in the dialysis population. Mm -hmm. uh, nationwide, we've been involved in almost every single nephrology organization. So it's been a very wild ride. And now we're only 100, you know, physicians, and, uh, and it continues to grow. So it's been fun. You know, when you mentioned that, that at the time, just with 13 <coughs> physicians, that it was one of the largest collectives of nephrology um, physicians, you said in the country. If, if, Correct. So at that point, you know, I think it sounds like if nothing else, the need always existed, but it's just you've been able to expand the level of care to where people understand where they can go. That is correct. Um, the need was there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's sad, but the need was there and we needed to be prepared. Um, you mentioned something that is correct. One of our um, nurses that is going to retire by the end of this year after 50 years, it tells you that one of the contributions of a great leader, like DNA has had many, has been being surrounded by the people that really make changes. Mm. And, uh, that's very important for a leader. Well, I love that you said that because I would love to ask from your perspective, you've hold, held multiple leadership roles yeah. 
um, within the organization over the years. What's one of your first or earliest memories with, with DNA? Well, the initial, it was hard work. Everybody was working very hard, long hours. You did not measure. You just did what needed to be done. And everybody was doing the, the same thing. Uh, and uh, so you did not have to time to think about <laughs> what am I going to do tomorrow. That sounds uh, about like entrepreneurship. It is. It is. <laughs> and remember, at that time, there was no cell phones. I mean, how did we exist without cell phones? But we did. Uh, there was uh, nothing different. So I think um, the memories are more out there working uh, at, at different places, different clinics and different hospitals. Mm -hmm. When I think about your earliest memories with DNA, I can imagine if we look flash back to that point you know how's the the type of care changed during your tenure the dialysis was very limited at that time and in fact um, there were some areas in the in the nation that had what was what it was called the death panels mm. panels at hospitals that would decide you will dialyze not this one and the person that they dialyze won't survive long mm. uh, that I'm glad to say um, disappeared, but it was, but it due was strictly to shortage of availability. Exactly, exactly. So uh, there were more uh, dialysis um, equipment mm -hmm. made. There was a lot of patients doing dialysis at home. We think that home dialysis is something new. Absolutely not. But you know, I would remember 40 years ago. I mean, there was a lot of patients on dialysis at home, mm -hmm. different ways. Technically, uh, dialysis is much better than mm -hmm. what we did before. Uh, healthcare has improved the care uh, of patients, the delivery of care, the availability of care, mm -hmm. um, and and also the training uh, has has improved tremendously. So patients have a significant improvement from what we had before. Families were very involved in in the care, um, and uh, and there was limitations of what they could do mm -hmm. today we have more availability so. yeah being able to educate them on on what they can do and empowering them Correct. a yep. little bit yep. more well i'd love to hear about you do you have any idea of how many patients you've seen throughout your career like if we're throwing out a number i'd you know, <laughs> not sure where to start i would there would i i i, yeah. I would not no, how many? Yeah. I can imagine. But, well, is there, you know, I'd love to hear about a story. Maybe there's a, a you know, a memorable moment or, um, you know, a, a specific patient story, if you're open to sharing. There, there are many um, specific stories and, 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 and some of them being sad, which I will not mention, but, but at the end of the day, um, as a physician, you're walking into the life of a patient. So we, the art of medicine is being able to have that door open, that window open, so that you can get into their lives and learn from them. It's not, it's not just them learning from me, but I learn from them uh, because every patient is a different world. So with, with that said, I've been in ball games with patients. I've been with uh, patients also on the set side on, on funeral that, that the family has invited me to be there. And you understand that you made a difference in the family. So, so your patients suddenly become your family. Uh, dialysis side, um, there's, there's nothing in medicine, in any practice of medicine, where you have contact with your patient on a weekly basis. Mm. Those are the patients that are on the kidney machine. You have a contact with them on a weekly basis. There's nowhere in medicine you do that. So, as you know, if you get ill, then you go and see your doctor. Otherwise, you see them once a year. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true in dialysis. So, so you develop a bond. So, my patients will tell me if I'm gaining weight. My patients will tell me if I need a haircut. Uh, <laughs> and they will tell me. They, yes, I have gone uh, to make rounds with a, with a hula, you know, skirt and coconut bras. I, there's pictures of me, uh, you know, making rounds at the clinic like that. But um, a smile or a laugh out of a patient, that's the best medicine there is. Absolutely. So, so. Well, some, you, you, so you bring the humor. And I, yes. I, 
I think it's so important, you know, that we focus on the authentic and human element of the healthcare that that you all bring. And, you know, from everyone that I've spoken with, from meeting Dr. Liang, meeting so many of the physicians and the nurses that are, you know, involved in the clinical staff and seeing patients on on such a regular basis, like you said, you can tell that there's a level of care. Mm -hmm. And you said, welcome, you're, you're learning from them. And, and I can imagine, you know, as a doctor, you're being able to even understand chronic kidney disease, ev- you know, even better every single patient that you talk to because you're understanding patterns and, and things like that that you're seeing. The, um, with time, you learn that the um, definition of a good physician is not he or she who knows the most, but he or she that cares the most. So I may not have answers to your problems or your questions, but we will find out. Let's let's go and dig and, and find out. And that's really the true nature of what we do. Uh, so I think that, um, like I was meeting a new patient uh, yesterday, and I said, if you're looking for a professional, you came to the wrong place. Now, if you're looking for somebody that will, let's, let's walk together and, and try to find answers, we, we will do that. So, mm-hmm. so I think every in every patient, as I said, is a different world. So I, you learn a lot from your patients. So it's, uh, it's been fun. It's been wild, and healthcare is changing quite a bit. That's the, that's the bottom line. Yes, absolutely. You know, and and that's I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm curious as to how Dallas Nephrology Associates has contributed to overall and influenced the field of nephrology. Because if you've been a leader. From 1971, 72 to today, how you know? How do you feel like that influence has been felt? You know, across the country, maybe even feel worldwide. We have, um, you know, I, I would say happily we have been involved with research uh, for a long time. But research not only on dialysis machines, but on medications and uh, things that are now available. Uh, uh, we created some early dialysis software systems uh, that that now have been used and now we have superior uh, software systems. So so it's been fun to see the growth mm-hmm. and also how things, uh, the direction is taken at, at times. Um, and I believe that we're in an era of healthcare that we just don't comprehend how big this is going to be. Um, uh, augmented intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence is going to change healthcare uh, quite a bit. Um, and, and it's good because there's no way the human mind can keep up with all the advancement on a weekly mm-hmm. basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're going to need, uh, I tend to forget my wife's name at times, so that means my <laughs> computer we is We can all use full. a prompt That's now right. or then. That's right. So, <laughs> But uh, healthcare is uh, changing, and we want to be sure it's, it's used the right way. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Absolutely. You know, I got to sit down with Ed, the director mm-hmm, of IT, mm-hmm. um, with DNA, and um, him and Ben, who's in finance, also talked about just the emergence of telemedicine, you know, something that had been discussed, obviously maybe available before 2020, but also not something that was, um, you know, as used as prevalently as it is today, what, do you, what are your thoughts in terms of telemedicine? You mentioned artificial intelligence, so I'm just curious of that element of um, it has, change. It has open um, areas that uh, was difficult uh, for us to, to do what we needed to do. I'm cautious in what I'm telling you in, in the sense of a good tool used the wrong way becomes a bad tool. Yes. Okay. Yes. Telemedicine is one of those tools that is fantastic tool, but you, we have to learn to use it appropriately. So telemedicine was not made for me to have breakfast at home in shorts and brown by telemedicine. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, you can reach out areas that you can reach out because of, you know, uh, limitations, let's mm-hmm, say, mm-hmm. and you can talk to patients, you can see patients, you can have a, a small assessment of a patient. We, uh, DNA, uh, for over, I would say, 30 years, we've had offices in Puerto Rico. So I can listen to your heart and your lungs. 
in Dallas uh, through telemedicine uh, and mm -hmm. assess the patient in a, one of our clinics there that, that, that we couldn't do before. So. Having a, a doctor that's on site in Puerto Rico, but then you're being able to be the the nephrology, you know, physician Correct. Correct. Spe specializing in in aiding a primary care physician. Correct. 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 Like Correct. That. Correct. Absolutely. I, what you said probably could not be, um, you know, restated enough that a bad tool or you know a tool can be used in the wrong way. I can imagine that um, if we're looking at any, um, you know. Physicians going through their training, you know, this has to be a new level of training around how to identify so many things because you can lose quite a bit from a screen. So there's got to be a lot of contextual clues I can imagine that you have to be looking you, for. You have to, um, because telemedicine being one that um, can easily be abused and, and, and I don't think would help patients. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it uh, you, you see how is so nice that if you come from work and you're not feeling well and maybe coughing and uh, you can get somebody by telemedicine when you get home at six in the evening, mm -hmm. that could be helpful. Telemedicine wasn't made to assess somebody that is having chest pain. Yeah. So, so I think we have to learn the limitations of telemedicine. Absolutely. Well, and I, I've had a chance to also talk with David um, in HR from, from DNA, and we got to talk a lot about community involvement and just the level of um, volunteering that, you know, all of the employees are involved in and, um, you know, the, the different organizations that, that have been involved. So I'd love to hear your perspective of, you know, maybe the growth of, of that involvement over the years. DNA has been involved in... Um with the Dallas County Medical Society, for mm. example, and has been in the multiple leadership levels of the Dallas County. And and I'll give you an example. There was a, a project uh, that lasted for about 10, 12 years called Project Access that would uh, help uh, patients in the community that have no insurance mm. uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. And and we would uh, support them and have we would have clinics where one of us would go uh, to uh, visit and see those patients that couldn't go to a doctor. Uh, and, and it was very nice. You helped the community uh, that way. We've been involved with the National Kidney Foundation, uh, especially in North Texas, where we have done clinics uh, to evaluate and assess patients that are having kidney problems, but they were not aware they were mm. having kidney problems. Mm -hmm. So and the National Kidney Foundation has been wonderful in doing this this type of clinics. And uh, sometimes we would assess a hundred patients in four hours and uh, wow. um so uh so it's been it's been an a, a, a way to give back to the community what the community needs and uh, and that's important. Absolutely the better together aspect. And that I know you, you personally have been involved in a lot of those associations, yes, yes. you know, at a, at a leadership level. Why do you feel like Dallas might be a hub? Do you feel like it just is something that, you know, DNA started and then it's just continued to grow from there? Or, you know, Dallas in comparison to the rest of the country, um, you know, how are they leading in terms of nephrology? It's, uh, it's an interesting question. And, and in the nephrology world, um, for many years, Everybody said, "Well, how, what is Dallas doing? This, why, what is, how is Dallas <laughs> dealing with this problem?" So, for some reason, this this was out there saying, and 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 there's many nephrologists in different uh, states that would uh, pick up the phone and call and mm. say, "You know, life is about relationships." So, so you know, pick up the phone and say, "We're having this problem. What are you guys doing there?" Compare. And we all learn. We yeah. learn from them. They learn from us. And, uh, um, and, and that's the way that I think we all get better because the, at the end of the day, you want to deliver better care mm -hmm. for the patient. So, so, so it was, uh, you know, I, I, I think we all learn that uh, there's different ways of doing it. It's not working harder. It's working more intelligently, it's being more efficient. We also, especially DNA, uh, we, we've been involved with, multiple projects with the federal government, with CMS, with Medicare. Mm. And uh, 
we're currently involved in, in one and we'll be involved in several other ones. So again, it's to learn the efficiency of how to deliver better care mm-hmm. uh, um, and what the, we now call value, you know, value care. Value and, care. Uh, and we're all learning together on this. So uh, you, you want to be at the table or if not, you're going to be part of the many. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned it before. I think a strong foundation of research and being able to be, be a, a resource for that that others can can learn from, and that's where you can base so much off of. Correct. So, over the last 50 years, what do you feel like, or, or maybe I should say over the last 38 years of you practicing, what do you feel like are some of the most common questions that um, chronic kidney disease patients and or their families are asking you? And so you just saw a new patient, for example. So, you know, what do you feel like are some common themes that are coming up? One of the most common statements made is they told me my kidneys are not working, but they don't hurt. They're not hurting mm. me. That's the first common uh, question. If they don't hurt, then um, they're fine. I said, no, that's not true. Mm. Number one, kidneys don't hurt. Um, that is rare when they hurt. But number two, you can have significant kidney damage and not have any symptoms. Um, so that's a that's a common uh, area. Um, the the um, the other thing is the assessment that personal physicians will do, the primary care physicians will do. Nine out of ten times, they can assess if there is a potential kidney problem. So that's where I first tell the patients that's the, your main gate. Go mm-hmm. to your primary mm-hmm. care physician and uh, be sure that you get uh, a simple what we call urinalysis, a urine test, mm-hmm. and a simple blood test. Though you don't require anything else initially, and you can assess uh, uh, and, and find significant problems if there is, and you know, if they have any. You know, I'm one of those patients where I'm like, just run all the tests. Let's find it out. Like, I r- run the screenings, we'll run the tests, let's yeah. know about uh, it. <laughs> but that's easier said than done in a lot of cases. It is, so. it is. Especially in the COVID era, you know, it's not yeah. that easy anymore. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would love to leave us on this note. You know, you've you've served in in several different medical leadership roles mm-hmm. um, throughout your career. What do you want your legacy or, or that of DNA to be? The, uh, uh, the 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 DNA one has been. Uh, we've been there from day one. Hopefully, we'll be there forever or till till the end of the story, mm-hmm. uh, and that we will continue to evolve, just like healthcare is. Yeah. We will continue to evolve and see how we can manage and do things better. Mm-hmm. Uh, on my end uh, has been contribution uh, to the system, um, having fun, uh, understanding that this is work, but you can have fun having you know doing all of this. And most of it, patients. Uh, patients have had uh, respect for you, have uh, built a bond with you. That's that's the best of, of the worlds. So um, I feel sad when I cannot deliver what the patient needs. Mm. And, uh, and it's difficult. Mm-hmm. You know? I hope in the future we will be able to cure, if not delay, um, patients getting on dialysis. Mm-hmm. That would be the beauty of yeah. this, not letting anybody getting on dialysis. Yeah. And hopefully transplantation has helped, but we also need improvement in transplantation. Do you have any projection of what, you know, are we 50 years away from it? Or is it much like trying to find a cure for cancer at this I point? I think in the next five to 10 years, we'll know more about what people think is available, uh, artificial kidneys. Mm-hmm. Uh, We'll know a lot more about that. Uh, will we be able to use kidneys from animals? Maybe. Mm. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, and I think transplantation is looking at that, that potential of being able to transplant without having to use any of the medications that we use today. Would that be a possibility? That's a possibility. There's a, this this yeah. is all work in progress yeah and uh that would be a beauty to, to be i think when you see a patient that suffers during their kidney treatments gets transplanted 
and has almost as close to a normal life as that's that's what you say. Yeah. That's that's what I want to get everybody to. So if well, possible, so. that is fascinating, and I think so important. You said it best value-based care. And I think, you know, anybody who's met you, I have, um, I've heard your legacy before I actually uh -uh. met you. So you definitely have made a lasting mark on, um, you know, your patients, your coworkers and your colleagues. And, you know, but I do think that value-based care is absolutely something that I've seen as a theme from everyone that I've spoken with at DNA. And it definitely seems to be what they're serving. So I'm so glad you got to take some Thank time you. and Thank share you. a little bit about Thank your you. experience you know, over these last three decades of, of being part of the team. I know they're grateful for you. It's been fun. It's been fun, and I <laughs> hope it continues to be fun. So Absolutely. We'll never, you know, and that's the other thing, you never look back and say, I made a mistake in what, you know, mm. on my decision. Absolutely not. You, there's no, no day in my life that I've looked back and says, what did I do 40 years ago? No. Uh, not true. When all when on all those hard days, that's when you're throwing the hula scoot. Right? That's, that's, <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> Thank oh, you so much okay. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in today. Learn more about Dallas Nephrology Associates at www.dnef.com. That's D-N-E-P-H.com. And if you found the information valuable, be sure to share with those also impacted by chronic kidney disease. Dallas Nephrology Associates DNA podcast series, Let's Talk About Kidneys, is provided for general information purposes only and does not replace the need to talk with a healthcare professional about your unique situation, care, and options. Our goal is to provide you with as much information as possible so you can be as informed as possible. Reference to any specific product, service, entity, or organization does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by DNA. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity or organization they represent. The views and opinions expressed by DNA employees, contractors, or guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of DNA or any of its representatives. Some of the resources identified in the podcast are links to other websites. These other websites may have differing privacy policies from those of DNA. Please be aware that the internet sites available through these links and the material that you may find there are not under the control of DNA. DNA shall have no responsibility for the accuracy, legality, or content of the external site or subsequent links. Contact the external site for answers to questions regarding its content. The resources included or referenced in the podcast and on the website are provided simply as a service. DNA does not recommend, approve, or endorse any of the content on the linked sites. The content provided on this website and in the podcast is not medical advice and should not be used to evaluate, diagnose, treat, or correct any medical condition. The content is solely intended to educate users regarding chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, ESRD, end-stage kidney disease, ESKD, and related conditions, and ESRD, ESKD treatment options. None of the information provided on this website or referenced in the podcast is substitute for contacting a healthcare professional.